Well, welcome everybody to the first of two Frankie Visiting Fellows Lectures, uh, our opportunity to share with the larger Yale community work in progress by James McCauley tonight and by Alejandra Oliva on Thursday, April 21st. The Frankie Visiting Fellows serve as catalysts for intellectual gatherings at the Whitney Humanities Center setting their own agendas and presenting their work to the community. Their presence ensues ongoing interdisciplinary exchange and creative debate at the Whitney in particular and at Yale in general. Uh, Frankie Visiting Fellows are an integral part of the Whitney Humanities Center Fellowship and this year I've been especially grateful to James McCauley and Alejandra Oliva for their supportive presence in our Wednesday Fellows Forum. The Frankie Visiting Fellows Program is made possible by the generosity of Richard and Barbara Frankie who have done so much for the Whitney Humanities Center. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce James McCauley, whom we've come to know as Jake. He graduated from Harvard with a degree in history and literature. Awarded a Marshall Scholarship in his senior year, he went on to complete a PhD in history at Oxford University, then served as Paris correspondent for the Washington Post while he continued his research in French history. In 2021, Jake published The House of Fragile Things, Jewish Art Collectors and the Fall of France, just now awarded the National Jewish Book Award. It was all over Twitter last night. <laughs> this gripping book, really gripping book, takes us into the world of the great Jewish art collectors of 20th century France describing their contribution to a French nation that ultimately betrayed and destroyed them. Next, Jake will publish a biography of the Zionist philanthropist Edmond de Rothschild in Yale University Press's Jewish Lives series. The work Jake has been doing here at the Whitney widens his lens. Black Milk of Dawn will be an overarching history of Holocaust memory reconsidered at this crucial moment when the last witnesses are dying. He will show that there was never anything automatic about naming or remembering the Holocaust, and that denial and revisionism have dogged the efforts of historians from the beginning. This is a, a courageous project, for he's willing to look at the cracks in the edifice of Holocaust memory and to interrogate its possible futures. I should add that Jake is one of my favorite opinion writers, whether he's <laughs> writing about the demise of the French left in the New York Review of Books, calling Putin on his distortions in the Washington Post, or challenging Alan Finkelkraut on cancel culture hysteria <laughs> on France Culture Radio. Jake's exemplary engagement as historian and critic shows that understanding the past can contribute to being a positive agent for change in one's own time. Please join me in welcoming Jake McCauley. Uh, um, well, thank you so much, Alice, for that very kind introduction, and indeed for having me here at the Whitney. It has been just an incredible opportunity to read and think and reflect these past couple of months, and I'm afraid you're going to have to prime me out of the office when the clock runs out. Um, and thank you to all of our audience members for joining tonight. Um, I really appreciate that. And it has been just a pleasure, more than I can say, um, to be here and to begin the research for my next book, um, which Alice mentioned briefly and which is tentatively titled Black Milk of Dawn, Jewish Survival and Holocaust Memory. I'm going to talk with you today about Salo Barone, one of the principal characters in that story, a man whose personal journey I find immensely inspiring and whose historical writings I find compelling, confusing, and from time to time frustrating, sort of all at once. 
And I should say that um, you know, I have my background in French history, and these are sort of new readings for me. And I'm well aware that many of our esteemed uh, guests in the audience tonight are, are, are far more well-versed than I am in Baron and, and all of his work. So um, please let me know if I get anything wrong, and I, I welcome any, um, any feedback you may have um, at the end. Um, but first of all, a brief bit of biography on Barone, um, whose student, Yosef Yerushalmi, later called him the greatest, uh, sorry, this is, this is Barone himself, whose student, um, Yosef Yerushalmi, later called him the greatest Jewish historian of the 20th century, a title I don't think anyone has ever disputed and that I myself will certainly not be disputing tonight. Indeed, Barone, who spent his entire career laboring over his 18-volume Social and Religious History of the Jews, was the 20th century's answer to the likes of Simon Dubnow and Heinrich Graetz from the 19th century. Like Dubnow's Weltgeschichte and Graetz's Geschichte der Juden, Barone's social and religious history was an attempt by one man to write the entire course of Jewish history, a monumental task if ever there were one. And this was truly his life's work. He began the project as a young scholar and was constantly expanding the volume until just before his death in 1989. Um, and these, uh, of course, are Barone's antecedents, Greats and, and Dupe now. Um, so to continue, um, Barone was born into a wealthy family in Tarnow in Galicia, which is in present-day Poland. His father was a banker and was also the president of the town's Jewish community, and it was a population of roughly 16,000, according to available estimates that we have. Um, by all accounts, the young Barone was already a polymath. In keeping with the style of local Jewish elites at the time, he could speak Polish, Yiddish, Biblical and modern Hebrew, French and German, and his students, among whom rank some of the greatest Jewish historians of the 20th century, Yerushalmi, whom, whom I've already mentioned, but also Arthur Hertzberg, the list goes on and on, would recall his ability to lecture without notes in at least five languages. And here I am lecturing with notes in my own native language. So, I mean, it's quite impressive. In any case, um, Barone received rabbinical ordination at the Jewish Theological Seminary in Vienna in the early 1920s and earned no fewer than three doctorates from the University of Vienna all by 1923. He began his teaching career at the Jewish Teachers College in Vienna but Rabbi Stephen Wise persuaded him to move to New York to teach at the Jewish Institute of Religion there, which he did by the end of the decade. And of course, it was there um, in New York that he was poached by Columbia University a few short years later, where he became the first to teach Jewish history as a historical discipline in the American University. And there's been much written about that, including a recent volume by many leading scholars in the field celebrating his contribution to Jewish studies in the American University specifically. But just a little bit more about his attachment to Columbia. Um, in May 1928, Linda Miller of New Rochelle, New York, sent a letter to Nicholas Butler, who was then the president of Columbia, informing him of her desire to establish an endowed chair in Jewish history in honor of her late husband, who had died about six months before. And by the way, this is a picture from the Columbia archives of the university in the 20s, sort of around the time when he would have arrived. Um, and all the letters between Linda Miller and Butler are in the Columbia archives, and Miller's vision for this new teaching role is quite revealing, I think. And I quote, I should like to make it clear that it is the spiritual and intellectual aspects of Jewish life that I should hope to see accentuated in the courses, rather than the nationalistic ideas which have recently become popular in some quarters, she wrote to the university president. Eventually, the search landed on Barone, although not without its share of drama, as usual, and he took up his post in 1930, and he was on the Upper West Side until his retirement, until his retirement in 1963. By the time he arrived at Columbia, of course, Barone was already well known for an article that is still an essential reference for all students of Jewish studies, and which, sadly, seems to be the only piece of his work that is still widely read today. This, as many of you may guess, is the essay entitled Ghetto and Emancipation, his famous 1928 argument against the so-called lachrymose conception of Jewish history before emancipation in the French Revolution. This was a hugely influential intervention, and it's this argument that would inform the rest of his long and prolific career. 
and I quote, surely, Barone wrote in the last line of that piece, it is time to break with the lachrymose theory of pre-revolutionary woe and to adopt a view more in accord with historical truth. I should also note that in that volume I mentioned, um, uh, recently published in honor of Barone's legacy, there's a masterful examination of that essay and its themes by none other than Yale's own David Sorkin. Um, but in general, Barone was skeptical of the view that saw emancipation as the solution to the Jewish problem in Europe, and he argued contra greats and others that, and I quote, there was no complete contrast between the black of the Middle Ages and the white of the post-emancipation period. What mattered for Barone was that Jewish history was not to be understood as a teleology of tragedy or as a saga of suffering. But Barone could scarcely have imagined or anticipated the brutal century into which he was born, one that was certainly the most lachrymose of any in the entire Jewish experience. And this is, um, by the way, a photograph of um, Barone's hometown, Tarnov, from the, the US Holocaust Memorial with um, the, it, it captures sort of Nazi persecutions of the actual community that he came from. Um, so although he had left Europe years before, the Holocaust was more than a rupture in his understanding of Jewish history and its evolution. It was a deeply personal rupture as well. And this, I think, is a significantly underappreciated aspect of his own story and scholarship. Most of his family that had remained in Europe, including his parents and a sister, were murdered. But even still, he continued with his argument against the lachrymose theory, insisting that Jewish history could not be allowed to become a history of persecution alone, but that it was a history of the intellectual, cultural, and even spiritual responses that the Jews had faced as a people throughout their long history. Barone found solace in the promise and the reality of Jewish survival, at least as he understood it. In my readings so far, and there are so many of them when it comes to Salo Barone, among the most poignant has been the conclusion of volume three of Barone's first draft of A Social and Religious History of the Jews, which was published by Columbia University Press in 1937. So after Hitler's rise to power, after the Nuremberg Laws, but before the full extent of Nazi barbarity was clear. At the end of this shorter, although still three volume version of the book that would later become Barone's magnum opus, he acknowledges the concern he correctly assumed would be on his readers' minds. Would the Jewish people withstand the Nazi menace gaining traction by the day? He was adamant in his response, and he insisted that the answer was already clear in the course of the history he had told in the approximately 1,000 pages up to that point. And here I quote, the answer to the searching question of our time is evidently given, he wrote. The Jewish people and their religion are going to survive the present extraordinary crisis. And he under, underscored our going. He quoted the book of Isaiah and called on Jewish leaders to, quote, sing, a new, sing unto the Lord a new song, a song that rebuilt Jewish life throughout, or through culture and education as a value worthy of affirmation. But this was before the final solution, a catastrophe that would touch Barone personally and professionally, because the man who argued so powerfully that Jewish history itself was a form of solace and a blueprint for re regeneration in and of itself was suddenly confronted with the question of memory, specifically what to remember about the Holocaust, which in Barone's time did not yet even have a name. How much weight was this unspeakable event, which Barone initially called the Great Catastrophe, to be given in the long durée of Jewish history, the likes of which he wrote over the course of his entire career? And most importantly, did it represent the refutation of the anti lachrymose convictions once and for all? In my talk today, I'm going to examine Barone not so much as a historian, but as an historical actor himself as someone involved intimately with the construction of Holocaust memory in two key moments. First in Offenbach, after the war with the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Project, and then at the Eichmann trial, where he was a star witness for the prosecution. In Zahor, the classic 1982 treatise on Jewish history versus Jewish memory written by Barone student Yerushalmi, we are asked the following question in the introduction. And here I quote Yerushalmi, but what were the Jews to remember and by what means? Barone himself had his answers and his life and his career were a sort of explanation. So to begin with Offenbach after the war, 
Um, before the end of the Second World War, the American Jewish Conference published a pamphlet entitled Program for Postwar Jewish Reconstruction, calling for an end to anti-Semitism, aid for surviving European Jews, a war, a war crimes tribunal, and restitution of stolen property. It was Barone who wrote this pamphlet, and it was significant that he used the word reconstruction. This was very much the view of American Jewish organizations in those days, unable to process um, in the sort of minute detail, the unfolding disaster in its full totality, and therefore focusing on, the, um, on what was to come after the war, which had yet to arrive. Barone was seemingly incapable at that time of grasping the extent of the ongoing persecutions in Europe, not to mention their intensification. Like many other Jewish scholars of his time, especially in the United States, he assumed that the Jews would survive Nazism as they had survived other pogroms and expulsions in the past. In 1940, Barone wrote the following, reflecting on the nature of Europe's multinational empires that he so valued. It has been an old historic, and I, this is, I'm, this is I, and I quote, it has been an old historic experience that the Jews suffered more heavily in purely national states than in countries of multiple nationality. Germany's nationalistic spirit draws the country irresistibly into military adventures. Should it win and conquer large territories, it would lose its national homogeneity and become a state of multiple nationality, which incidentally might cool its anti-Semitic zest. So that's Barone in 1940. Eventually, Barone and others confronted with the, were, were confronted with the extent of the destruction and the devastation, including the loss of his two parents and one of his sisters. He would later recall that Tarnov, which had about 20,000 Jews before the war, had only about 20 when he next visited in the 1950s. And yet, despite his immense personal trauma and profound loss, he refused to alter his view of either the Jewish past and certainly not the Jewish present. He threw himself into aiding survivors however he could, but as an architect of post-war memory, his view seems to have been, or one of the architects, I should say, of post-war memory, his view seems to have been that what was most important to remember was the richness of the civilization that once was, not so much the evil mechanics of the destruction itself. Barone soon headed what was called the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, which was a task force sponsored by the US government in April 1947 to collect and distribute airless Jewish property in the American occupied zone of Germany after World War II, so based in Offenbach. Those who worked with Barone on that project were fellow future arbiters of Holocaust memory, not all of whom agreed with him, I should, I should note. Hannah Arendt especially, but also Lucy Davidovich and Gershom Sholem were all in some ways involved with this post-war restitution project. So this, um, the, the, uh, the archives in Washington, D.C. have many of the materials pertaining to this task force. This is one of them. Um, here is Hannah Arendt, one of Barone's, uh, his, sort of his deputy and colleagues in that, uh, that major undertaking. And here is Lucy Davidovich as a young, um, as a young student. Um, let's see. Um, through Jewish cultural reconstruction, Barone was building a Holocaust memory that was based on his image of the Jewish people's enduring strength and above all else, will to survive. He by no means ignored the extent of the catastrophe in Europe, a catastrophe that, as we've mentioned, had claimed members of his own family, but he was nevertheless invested in designing and advocating um, a means of continuation by whatever means. And here I turn to the historian Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, who has written that Barone insisted that there were two essential elements in what she calls Jewish continuity. That is, first, a maintained commitment to tradition, and second, the enduring ties of Jewish community. So in 1945, before the war had even ended, Barone was still expressing these hopes, um, however fanciful they may seem to us now. And here I quote, religious history has given us evidence of how deeply humanity may sink and still rise again to high spiritual levels. It is not unreasonable to hope that out of the depths of misery and despair, some new saving forms of belief and observance may arise, which will provide an answer to the perplexities of our Jewish experience. 
As the historian Elizabeth Galas has noted in her brilliant recent study, A Mortuary of Books, Barone's general idea was that salvaging the material remains of, Jewish civil, of the Jewish civilization that had been would keep future generations building on those traditions of the past and furthering Jewish knowledge in the present. As Galas writes, his efforts to salvage cultural property fit with the notion in every respect, symbolizing the potential to secure and preserve past worlds, their knowledge and traditions. When he was asked to sum up the work of the JCR, the, um, this organization in 1955, Barone underscored all of those themes. And he wrote, the Jewish people succeeded in salvaging 500,000 volumes, 1,200 scrolls of law, 7,000 artistic and ceremonial objects. He wrote, far beyond their monetary value, these collections symbolize the continuity of the heritage of the Jewish people. In a letter he sent to the State Department, the objects he and his team were able to recover, especially the books, were the material manifestations of the legacy he sought to reconstruct. He wrote that books have always been the very lifeblood of the people of the book, which shows that for him, books were a kind of representation of the Jewish people as a whole. To save their orphan books was thus to preserve what mattered most about the Jews as a civilization and a culture. And this, um, as you can see, this is a photo of um, some of the books that were recovered in that sort of Offenbach initiative. And now to look at the Eichmann trial a little bit and Barone's testimony at that moment. So the next moment when he was a major actor in the emergence of Holocaust memory was the Eichmann trial, which needs no introduction. It's unclear if Barone ever knew he wasn't the Israeli government's first choice as the prosecution's star witness. They had wanted the historian and jurist Jacob Robinson, who served as a special advisor on Jewish affairs at the Nuremberg trials to Israel at, and, and also to Israel at the United Nations. Uh, most famously, Robinson would write the blistering rebuttal to Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, a book entitled, And the Crooked Shall Be Made Straight. But the Israeli consulate in New York reached Barone on the Upper West Side regardless, inviting him to participate in what was certainly among the most important events in the post-war attempt to establish a durable memory of the Holocaust. The significance of the Eichmann trial in the history of Holocaust memory is impossible to understate. The dramatic arrest and extradition of Adolf Eichmann from Argentina, sedated and dressed in an LL flight attendant's uniform, now captured in various uh, popular films and novels that I'm sure many of us have seen, was not just an attempt by the young state of Israel to establish itself on the world stage, although it was certainly a watershed moment in the country's history. In the words of the historian Tom Segev, once Ben-Gurion solemnly announced that the government had Eichmann in custody, and I quote, Israelis had not known since the Declaration of Independence so deep a sense of national unity. But the trial was more than a mere illustration of national strength. It was a deliberate attempt to show the world just what had befallen the Jewish people as a whole, little more than a decade before. And here I quote the famous first paragraph of the chief prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, who is on the left right there. Um, he gave a 10-hour speech at the trial. And this is, this is the, the first paragraph of his um, kind of quite amazing speech. Um, when I stand before you here, judges of Israel, to lead the prosecution of Adolf Eichmann, I am not standing alone. With me are six million accusers, but they cannot rise to their feet and point an accusing finger towards him who sits in the dock and cry, I accuse. For their ashes are piled up high on the hills of Auschwitz and the fields of Treblinka and are strewn in the forest of Poland. Their graves are scattered throughout the length and breadth of Europe. Their blood cries out, but their voice is not heard. Therefore, I will be their spokesman, and in their name, I will unfold the terrible indictment. Visibility was paramount to that indictment. Journalists from around the world covered the trial, as we all know, Hannah Arendt, but also Elie Wiesel and Hugh Trevor Roper from Britain, among others. Most importantly, as many of you know, this was the first trial ever to be recorded for television, as only select portions of the post-war Nuremberg trials were filmed. But a television network recorded the daily proceedings, which were then flown out every night to the Europe and the US, quite the undertaking for 1961. But this was the point of the entire exercise. As Gideon Hausner would later recall, the idea was that the whole world could watch. 
Barone took his assignment of being the historical consciousness of these six million absent accusers extremely seriously. His student, the great historian and rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, later recalled that he had never seen his, his professor as anxious as he was during his final preparations for the trial. And the Israeli government had made his assignment clear. In order to convict Eichmann forcefully, in order to demonstrate the full extent of his brutality and his evil, the prosecution needed to show the significance of what the Nazis had done and just what exactly they had destroyed. In advance of the trial, Hausner, and this I borrow from Deborah Lipstadt's book on the trial, Hausner had written to Barone that it was important to prove the Nazi intention to annihilate the Jewish people, and it is therefore vital for the trial to present documentation that will expose the national and cultural value of the Jewish centers that were destroyed in the Holocaust. When Barone arrived in Israel in late March 1961, he had an audience with none other than Ben-Gurion himself, and of course, that is Ben-Gurion. Um, we don't know exactly how the conversation went, but we do have what Ben-Gurion wrote in his diary after the encounter, which was that, and I quote, it is important to make clear to our youth the magnitude of the qualitative loss resulting from the extermination of six million, and therefore describe the spiritual character of the Jewry that was exterminated, present outstanding personalities like Einstein, Bialik, Dubnov, etc. And the historian um, Deborah Lipstadt, whom I just mentioned, has written in that same book that Ben-Gurion and Hausner were deeply anxious that Barone, a professor, would come across as boring. And Hausner actually tried to tell the renowned scholar from Columbia University to make sure his remarks were engaging, which did not go over well. Um, boredom, uh, as Barone said, boredom is relative and very often depends on the manner in which the facts are presented. He snapped back. Anyway, nothing was more boring than the testimony of the Yad Vashem representative regarding the validity of certificates and documents, and yet you accepted this testimony as being essential to the trial. Hausner let it go. You will, of course, express your opinions on historical issues as you see fit, he assured the visiting professor. Your unique scientific standing and your publications are, are sufficient guarantee that the picture you present will be accurate and enthralling. When Barone finally entered the witness box about two weeks into the trial, the judge asked him to put on a kippah and to take the oath. He obliged, but then quickly took off the kippah, apologizing for his imperfect Hebrew and delivering what was in many ways one of the most important speeches he ever gave. Barone's testimony was lengthy, but certain parts of it show how he tried to preserve his anti-lacrimose conception by presenting the Nazi menace as something that was entirely separate and distinct from previous pogroms or anti-Jewish persecutions. And this is Barone in the witness box. Um, the attempt to see Auschwitz as the culmination of the long history of anti-Semitism, he suggested, um, entirely missed the point. And I quote, such assertions malign the Middle Ages, he said while on the stand. Although there has been immemorial anti-Semitism, it is well to remember that there was practically no violence accompanied by bloodshed under the Persians or the Greeks. There were minor outbreaks in the days of Philo of Alexandria. There were no pogroms under the Muslims. But in keeping with both his earlier scholarship and his work in Offenbach, salvaging the remnants of Jewish culture, Barone also used his testimony to offer, most of all, an impassioned defense of the diaspora and all that it had achieved. And here I quote um, a passage from, from, his, from his own remarks. As a permanent minority for some 2,000 years, Jews were forced to seek the kinds of openings that were available to newcomers. When they found and used such opportunities, they were working for both their own benefit and that of society as a whole. I have long believed that much of Jewish history ought to be rewritten in terms of the pioneering services which the Jews were forced to render by the particular circumstances of their history. And he continued, with courage and perseverance, the Jewish people tried to adjust the new situation, not merely passively, but independently and creatively. Accustomed through the long history of their dispersion to such creative adjustments, they were able to develop during the interwar period certain new forms of communal and cultural living which fructified Jewish life throughout the world, contributed significantly to human civilization, and held out great promise for the future. 
All this was cut short by the Nazi attack, unprecedented in scope, geographic extension, and murderous intensity. And in another moment in his remarks, he said the following, of course, the Jewish people also had its sinners and idiots, thieves and lunatics. But on balance, future historians are likely to call the first third of the 20th century the golden age of Ashkenazi Jewry in Europe, just as they will see in it the beginning of a modern Sephardi Renaissance. The Israelis were upset with this testimony. Again, we have mostly just Ben-Gurion's diary, which was unsparing in its criticism of Barone. Just as I feared, Ben-Gurion wrote, we had failed miserably, adding that Barone embarrassed us deeply. The precise reasons for that opinion are unclear, but the historian Hanna Yablanka has suggested that it was likely that Barone had merely contradicted what was becoming the official Israeli narrative about the Holocaust, namely that it had marked the end of European Jewish civilization, which had been doomed for centuries anyway. But Barone's convictions could not be shaken. In conclusion, I think it's worth revisiting Barone's conception of Jewish survival as he aged. So in 1963, the year of his retirement from Columbia, he published an essay entitled Newer Emphases in Jewish History, which was a revision of an earlier essay he had written on the same topic years before. And this is a text in which he revisited his criticism of the lachrymose conception of Jewish history. All my life, he wrote, I have been struggling against the hitherto dominant lachrymose conception of Jewish history, a term which I have been using for more than 40 years, because I have felt that an overemphasis on Jewish sufferings distorted the total picture of the Jewish historic evolution and at the same time badly served a generation which had become impatient with the nightmare of endless persecutions and massacres. That line is often cited, but what follows is not which is Barone actively grappling with the extent of the Holocaust devastation, insisting that, and I quote, we must not misunderstand the true realities of life and psychology among those who had endured the recent catastrophe, including the inherent tragedies of Jewish life during the two millennia of the dispersion. This, I think, points to an important dimension of his opposition to the lachrymose theory as he aged. It, it comes across as though he doesn't have a firm answer anymore, and that perhaps the, his, the anti-lacrimose critique was never meant as an explanation for everything that could be applied at will. As we've seen, it was an active choice that was neither self-evident nor inevitable, and one with whom many others certainly disagreed, although today it has gained quite a, a dominant position. But perhaps most of all, for someone who had lost so much this way of writing and thinking the Jewish past was itself a form of survival, not collective survival, but personal survival. And that is the conclusion of my talk. Yes, with pleasure. Thank you. That was very moving. Can you say something about his wife, uh, Jean, I, I, I believe? Who, uh, Jeanette. My, Jeanette. Yeah. My, my recollection is that she was a sort of uh, full-time secretary and uh, Absolutely. Research, research assistant, but you know, never appeared on the title page of any, any of his work. Absolutely. I mean, I, I believe um, you know, his wife was absolutely influential on his work and you know, more than just as a secretary, as a real collaborator. And in many ways, um, a social history, a social and religious history of the Jews is work that they did together. Um, and you're right that she does not appear on the title page of the books, but it, it's um, from everything we know about how the book was produced and how it was written, especially as it was revised in later editions, she was hugely, hugely influential in how it was put together. Thank you for that, Jake. Could you say something about what um, motivated you to take on this project? Oh, well, um, <laughs> how much time do we have? Um, you know, I think I, I, I guess I've been interested in these questions for a very long time, um, particularly as 
um, an American Jew who grew up, um, I was born in 1989, sort of right before the fall of the Berlin Wall, in which, you know, at no point in my education was the Holocaust not a kind of major cornerstone. So, you know, that, that had a history, that had a whole sort of literature behind it. And I just became very interested, as indeed so many others have, in how we arrived at this conception that we know so much about today, which is the Holocaust, which you know, might have assumed and did assume different forms in different cultural contexts. And so looking at the immediate post-war with these characters, with these sort of active debates raging in that time was very interesting to me to see sort of the choices that were made and how we came to remember what we came to remember and what like how they emerged as they did but also what might have been um, because there were as we all know many other paths this whole memory project could have taken and so I find it quite interesting how it did evolve as it has. Thank you. Um, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm really compelled by your approach of thinking of him as a historical actor and not just a historian. And I would just love to hear you speak more about that, how that methodology came up for you, because yeah. um, I just find it really compelling. Uh, well, thank you so much for that question. You know, I'm not. I'm not sure. It's. Um, it's uh, super uh, complicated or anything. I mean, it just. It struck me that. In the aftermath of the war, you have not just Barone, but so many others, um, like Hannah Arendt, Lucy Davidovich, um, the list goes on. These were all the first, and like Raoul Hilberg, um, et cetera, these were all you know, the first major historians of the Holocaust. I mean, Barone, not so much the historian of the Holocaust, but you know, major Jewish historians of the time grappling with the Holocaust, I should say. And you know, they, they they were these amazing, in Barone's case, just stupendously prolific um, scholars, but they were more than that. I mean, they were, they were active participants in, I mean, many of them, like Barone, you know, had had um, the experience of having family killed. You know, Arendt herself was a refugee. Davidovich um, had been in Vilna before the war and had come back to Europe to do this part. So they were not just sort of passive observers of the events. The events had shaped all of their lives intimately. And I just think it's a mistake not to consider both at the same time and to consider the scholarship in some senses as an expression of the personal journeys that so many of them had. Because in a way, that was the sort of emotional drive behind so much of it, or so it seems to me. Thank you, Jake. That was um, an, an elegant analysis of Salo Baron. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in terms of the impact of the Holocaust on Baron, I think that the, the whole question of legal status and guarantee of rights, mm -hmm. it was central for him. After all, Baron was stateless for over 10 years. It was only when wise uh, invited him to come to New York to the Jewish Institute of Religion that Wise was able to um, flex his muscles with the State Department and to get Barone a visa and, and U.S. citizenship. Um, but you know, in his, in his later, in his essays from the 1960s, um, which I think reflected his own experience of statelessness with the collapse of the mm -hmm. uh, Austro-Hungarian monarchy. He wrote about the insufficiency of the, of the nation state as guaranteeing the rights of Jews and other minorities and looked forward to there being some kind of organization. Of course, the United Nations existed, the mm -hmm. League of Nations had failed at that, but some kind of international organization mm. which, would guarantee, which would guarantee basic rights. Mm. So um, you know, I'm wondering if you could just comment on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's certainly, I mean, again, you know this way, way better than I do. So I mean, that, that's absolutely something I will think more about as I continue my research. But that, in terms of what at least I have thought about so far, um, I mean, I think 
you absolutely get that sense in what he wrote about Nazism sort of even at the time. I mean, I even quote one of the passages where he says that it is this sort of national character of the enterprise that's so hostile to the Jews. And in fact, if Nazi Germany had become this sort of empire of sorts that was multinational, multilingual, et cetera, then perhaps things might have been otherwise. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, as for what he imagined in the long term in the post-war, I don't know as much. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think, um, I think the, the emphasis on these kind of supranational organizations would would put him in the context of many other thinkers of his time. So I mean, it's not necessarily unique in that regard. Um, but that's a really good uh, a point to examine further. Thank you. This has been enjoyable and moving. And I want to ask you whether there's, it felt like there was an intimation of a kind of anti-Jewish nationalist trajectory, first from the letters creating Barone's uh, post, and uh -huh. then uh, in kind of his conflict, explicit or implicit, with Ben-Gurion mm -hmm. at the trial. And I'm just wondering, you've, you've made kind of no reference to how the creation of the State of Israel did yeah. or didn't shape uh, Barone's picture. And it, I'm not asking you to speak to kind of the present, but in terms of thinking about, is this emphasis on a spiritual mm -hmm. status, which you know, he's how he referred to European Jewry, a kind of a consistent through line that pla did in fact place him at odds with a more political or nationalist orientation towards Jewishness? So that is an excellent question, and I'm very glad you raised that. Um, I think if I had more time, I would have sort of delved into that aspect of his work. So, but first of all, you know, Barone was a Zionist, absolutely. Um, I think the perceived conflict, which I'm not sure was an actual conflict with uh, Ben Gurion at the end, was perhaps over what kind of Zionism each imagined. So, I, I don't think that Barone was in any way anything but supportive of the establishment. I mean, he had visited several times before Eichmann. I mean, it wasn't something that he um, opposed by any means, and, and he was a sort of um, outspoken supporter of it. I just think that um, he did not necessarily agree with the I guess, official narrative at the time, which was to sort of disparage the diaspora as worthless, as doomed to fail, as um, something that was nothing but the antechamber to Auschwitz. And I think that that was the uh, disagreement, if ever there were one. I mean, but I, yeah, I, I, he was absolutely a, a, a Zionist, for sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. You, you allude to him, and I think this follows up on the previous uh, question, and that is, there seems to be a, a narrative that could be spelled out in terms of his relation to Sholem. I mean, two, I mean, towering yes. intellectuals, academics, but of very different sorts. And, and of course, and Sholem, on, and on, Sholem on was also too. involved in reclamation of yep. books from uh, after the Holocaust. So there's, in some ways, there are unparalleled paths which Absolutely. Don't, don't intersect or don't, or maybe intersect more than we've been able to see. I mean, I think one of the things that's been so interesting for me about this whole project is just um, the sort of interpersonal relationships among, as you say, so many of these towering figures that we all know, such as Sholem, Barone, but also Hannah Arendt. Um, I mean, I was, I was fascinated to learn that, I mean, the, I think Barone shared in the criticism of Eichmann in Jerusalem, but ultimately um, was very close with Arendt. I mean, in fact, I, I believe it was the Barones who were in Hannah Arendt's apartment when she died and who called the ambulance to collect her. I mean, so there was this sort of intimacy among this whole generation that went through these events together, even if they, they disagreed. So one of the things I'm hoping to do in the book is to tease out as much as possible some of those personal relationships that stitch these characters together, because I think that's quite... Um, it's quite illuminating, and it shows the the way that the dis well. I mean, as we all know from people who live in the real world, that disagreements between brilliant people are not always intellectual in nature. That there were sort of petty, personal elements of it as well. And I think that that's equally important in understanding how these these ideas and how these arguments get um, mobilized and defended. So I, I absolutely agree. Jake, this was just really um, so fascinating and obviously is just 
in part, a, a, a part of what you're going to be creating in this next book. Can you give us a preview of, I mean, you have just started to mm -hmm. give us a preview of the other aspects that you're mm -hmm. going to bring, the other people and the other aspects. Can you fill that out even more? I, obviously, this is sure. early on, but yeah, I'm well, just I mean, curious. It's, it's, sort of a, um, it's sort of being planned as we speak. But basically, um, I, I have several characters, one of which is Barone, but also um, uh, Hannah Arendt, Lucy Davidovich, um, Raoul Hilberg, and Elie Wiesel for the moment. And looking at the, I mean, the, um, that's a, it's, I should say, as we all know, it is an enormous, huge amount of material. But the way that I'm trying to sort of find my way through is to follow the characters at moments when they all reappear. And again, as I mentioned, they all knew each other and were largely in contact in many cases for their entire lives. So one of those moments would be Offenbach when so many of the characters work together. Another is the Eichmann trial when a lot of them have cameo appearances in different ways. Um, and then again in New York in the 1970s when so many are kind of debating um, like Lucy Davidovich and Hilberg, for instance, um, the, the meaning of it all. And so that's, um, that's how I've structured it. And I, I hope that it, will, that it will come together, but we shall, we shall see. Really, I had a very similar question. Yeah, but a, an angle on the question, which, you know, you were talking about the construction of a memory, so I wonder, when does it begin for you? And I guess that's a question of imagination. When does well what begin? The memory of the Holocaust. Yeah. When does it begin? Or when does the story that you're telling begin? Yeah. Um, that is another excellent question. Um, I think the, the, the question of when it begins has to be before the war is even over. Um, absolutely. And I think that... Um, you know, there are several important examples, but you know, one of them would be um, the, with the story of Emanuel Ringelblum in the Warsaw Ghetto, sort of actively collecting traces of the destruction while it was happening and shoving them underground to make sure that someone someday somehow would find them and know. Now, that's not necessarily um, telling people what the memory should be and arbitrating the shape and contours of it, but it is providing raw sort of primary sources, if you will, for someone else to construct it. But it does show a consciousness of the world historical significance of the event while it was unfolding and the imperative to have some basis to remember it. So I would say it, be, it definitely begins um, after the, I mean, while the war is still, is still raging. Um, but then also I think some of the, most important post-war beginnings of the, the memory question were, were the question of names, right? Um, and I mentioned that you know, at the very beginning, like for scholars like Barone, what Barone initially called the great catastrophe had no official name. You know, many used different names to describe it. And what's fascinating to observe and to, and to look at is the evolution of each of the terms offered um, to describe what we now call the Holocaust in English, but which is called the Shoah in Hebrew and French, um, how the terms emerged, what their antecedents were, what kind of implications they, they gave the event, and how it shaped public understandings of them. So I think that that's probably the next really crucial step. All right. Well, thank you all for coming so much. Yeah.